Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. And for those of you who are not here, like me, uh, a very good morning to us. So we uh, welcome all of you today to um, uh, witness our lecture, which I have renamed the Contained Series, which really is not contained right now with the COVID situation. But nevertheless, uh, let me just uh, ask everyone at this point to uh, put their videos off, please, except the speaker and I, who will shut it off in a little while, and mute your mics. Dr. Yamini Mubai, welcome to our forum. Uh, a little bit about her. Dr. Yamini Mubai completed her BA in South Asian Studies from Mount Holyoke College, and pardon me if I'm not pronouncing it correctly, uh, in the US, and received her master's, MPhil, and PhD in history from JNU Delhi. She also has an MSc in social policy from the London School of Economics. She's worked on iconic historic sites in India with UNESCO, ADB, and the World Bank, as well as the private sector foundations and Ministry of Culture, Government of India. She's taught at the School of Planning and Architecture, BML Munjal University and Mount Holyoke College in the US. She has received the Junior and Senior Research Fellowships from the University Grants Commission, a Charles Wallace Trust Fellow Scholarship, a DAD Scholarship for Doctoral Research in Germany, and a Senior Academic Fellowship from the Indian Council for Historical Research. She recently completed a Fulbright Nehru Academic and Professional Excellence Fellowship in the US. She's currently working on a major publication based on her research in the historic water management in Elora and Daltabad. And Dr. Yamini, I have to tell you, um, one of uh, my uh, um, colleagues at the Coatsen Institute, she also worked on some water management. Her PhD was on that, but it was not exactly in Daltabad, but in that area on the water irrigation system in the Deccan. So uh, Kanika Kalra is her name, Dr. Kanika Kalra. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But anyway, we are so, so happy to have you here to speak about this wonderful deity that uh, Dr. Kapila has given, uh, you know, a window, a window into that world. So over to you. And we really look forward to hearing about uh, uh, this deity. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Gupta. And uh, I would really like to uh, thank uh, the Himalayan Institute uh, for inviting me here today to be on, th on this platform. It's a great pleasure and an honor to be here uh, and uh, to share, uh, you know, a little bit about my experiences with, uh, uh, with the uh, local uh, deity, a local tradition at uh, Pithoragar. Uh, now Pithoragar, uh, I'm sure most of you know, is uh, a border district of Uttarakhand state. It is uh, on, it, uh, towards the east it borders uh, Nepal and towards the north it bo borders Tibet. Uh, so um, I also wanted to uh, start with a bit of a disclaimer that this is my, my research is uh, not exactly historical academic research. Uh, so, uh, so this is mainly experiential and uh, based on interactions with local communities, um, getting a sense of oral histories and of local traditions. Um, so it's been largely interview based uh, and observation based. So um, it is not, it does not, uh, you know, uh, I wouldn't call it uh, completely uh, uh, an orthodox academic project, but this was actually uh, a project that I was doing with the Asian Development Bank some time ago. Uh, we were developing a tourism infrastructure in uh, Uttarakhand and Pithoragar was one of our uh, sites where we were working. So it was then that I came across uh, the, this amazing tradition of Most Manu and uh, the temple of Most Manu. So, uh, so I'll, in fact, this talk will be, uh, you know, more by way of telling a story rather than, you know, quoting a lot of facts and figures and uh, boring stuff like that. So with your permission, um, I'll just, uh, you know, try to share my experience with you. 
so first of all for uh, i'm sure many of you have uh, traveled in that area the drive from almora to pithoragarh there's a big highway now and uh, there's this, there are spectacular views of the nanda devi and uh, panchachuli ranges which uh, almost seem to follow you as you move along the highway towards pithoragarh from almora and uh, when you near nearing pithoragarh the terrain tends to get a little more rugged uh, the the time i was traveling there quite regularly to do my work um, the army was building uh, a lot of infrastructure in that area pithoragarh being a border district has uh, quite a large uh, army pr uh, presence uh, and the i believe the air force also was building a large uh, in, uh, you know the installations in uh, in that region um so uh, the the road gets more rugged uh, there are serpentine bends and you go through forests and then you go climb up impossible looking hills and at one point uh, just before you reach the town of pithoragarh it's worthwhile to stop your car and just park it uh, on the side and you look down because the road runs along these um thundering rivers which are thundering far below the hill you know uh, you are on the road is on top of the hill and the rivers are running far below and but you can hear the roaring of that water so it's a, it's an amazing experience and you near the top of the hill and then you can see this bowl shaped valley below you and that is pithoragarh and you can of course see the town uh, spread out uh, under you um, there are there are five major rivers actually maybe even more but five major ones that uh, run through pithoragarh uh they are the ram ganga the gori ganga the kali ganga the saryu and the dhauli uh, i'm sure that uh, anjali will be familiar with quite a lot of them they are part of the ganga catchment uh, zone uh, all part of the catchment area of the ganges uh, so these are some of the important rivers that uh, run through uh, pithoragarh in fact i believe the kali ganga actually forms the border with nepal it runs along the border boundary as well so the town of pithoragarh lies in a valley that is locally known as a swar valley uh, it's a bowl shaped depression uh, surrounded by snow capped peaks i'm just going to i forgot to bring my screen on i'm just going to get that on for you uh, can everyone see these uh, this is the nanda devi panchachuli view uh i hope everyone can see it full screen yamini full screen yeah uh yes full, where is full screen can you see a part of it yeah yeah you just have to keep it on How the do I get on full the way that show. you had it in the beginning uh slide show okay. yeah on full screen Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, let's see. Slide show. For some reason, all the buttons have gone off. I mean, they're not. Uh... Hmm. Like, Can how did you have of... it in the beginning? You know, it was full screen at that point. Shall yeah. we get off the screen? Stop the screen share and go back. Yeah. Yeah. Let's stop it. Yeah. uh let's get back on yeah this is it this is it this is it no no this one yeah 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 all right i got it you are already sharing your screen on such okay i'll go back to zoom start the screen share where is it this one yeah Yes. Okay. Now you can. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, is this better? Perfect. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. What could I do without my assistance? Excellent. Okay. 
All right. Uh, so this is a view of the Nanda Devi Panchachuli range from which you see from the Almora Highway as you drive along towards Pithoragar. And this is what Pithoragar looks like uh, from from the highway when you are on a on a higher plane, and then you can see the valley uh, spread out below. I don't have too many slides, just very few, but uh, you know, just wanted to give you a sense of the terrain and the topography and uh, what uh, the place looks like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's quite ugly. Now it's literally. Pithoragar. Yeah. yeah, Pithoragar is an ancient settlement. Uh, it's a, it's, it's there, there is a wide variety of grains and fruit uh, that are grown. Uh, one of the local uh, community members told me that the range of fruits is from apples to banana, uh, so, sorry, bananas to apples. So in the lower parts, they grow bananas. And as you go higher up uh, these hills, uh, you even have apple orchards. So that's a vast that's a big climatic uh, range uh, that can grow fruits as uh, diverse as bananas and apples. And of course, you have a wide range of grains as well. There is, uh, it's believed that uh, Pithoragar was founded on a rice field. Uh, so it's uh, the association with, uh, you know, productivity and food and food grains is, is uh, quite ancient. Uh, there are minerals like copper, gold, and silver uh, that uh, have been found in Pithoragar. Uh, I was told that in the river waters, apart from the river waters also being full of fish, uh, which also sustained uh, the population, uh, there was also there are also trace elements of gold and silver that have been found in the rivers uh, uh, in, in Pithoragar. Uh, so it's an ancient settlement along the major trans-Himalayan trade and pilgrimage routes. And this is what I would really like to bring everyone's attention to, because we tend to forget that the Himalayas are corridors of movement. They are, uh, they, they are places for people and ideas uh, have moved up and down these corridors of, of connectivity for, uh, for millennia, actually. Two major pilgrimage routes intersect at Pithoragar. This is something that I would really like to flag, and that's a very important aspect. Two major pilgrimage routes. So you have the east-west route that goes from uh, India to Nepal, the pilgrimage to Pashupatinath temple in Nepal. And then you have the north-south axis going to Kailash Mansarovar, through the Lipu Lake Pass, right? So uh, Pithoragar is the natural point of the intersection of these two major trade routes. And, uh, perhaps that is one of the reasons why, uh, you know, it's such an important and ancient center uh, for feeding into these uh, two great uh, uh, pilgrimage routes. And as we know, pilgrimage routes are almost invariably uh, you know, transposed upon trade routes as well. So trade and pilgrimage have traditionally gone on together. There are, uh, there is evidence of prehistoric remains in the region. Uh, there have, uh, you know, stone flints, copper arrowheads, and iron implements have been found uh, in Pithoragar. Uh, little bit about the history. The area was ruled by the Katyuris. The Katyuris were an important and famous dynasty of Uttarakhand in the early medieval period. Uh, later, the Brahm dynasty of Nepal uh, ruled here until the 14th, 15th centuries. Now, the current settlement is believed to have been founded by Raja Pithora Chand. Pithora is a uh, local um, pronunciation of Prithvi. So the Sanskrit word Prithvi becomes Pithora uh, in the local dialect. So, in, uh, so the, the current settlement is believed to have been founded by Raja Pithora Chand of the Chand dynasty. 
which is another famous dynasty of Uttarakhand. The Chans and the Katyuris uh, you always hear about when you read uh, Uttarakhand history. Now, um, the cultural geography, uh, if you will, can be understood if one looks at a larger context of tribal clans that were based in surrounding settlements. So we have, if we look, you know, take a wider view of this current settlement of Pithoragarh and link it with other uh, settlements in the surrounding hills, all, uh, you know, some of them were, are quite far actually. Dharchula is almost 80 kilometers away, but nevertheless, all these settlements were linked through networks of, uh, of trade, um, you know, uh, they, they are, they're a tribal movement along these routes. So you had other settlements, uh, some of which uh, important ones are Didi Hart, uh, Gangoli Hart, Beri Nag. And today, if you go to these places, even Munsiari for that matter, uh, today, if you go to these places, uh, you will find that uh, most, many of them are centers for craft. Uh, and manufacturing. So uh, it, you had these, uh, you know, other settlements that were, you know, scattered in the wider region, uh, feeding into the main settlement, which was Pithoragar, through by providing uh, trading products uh, that were manufactured in those settlements uh, that were feeding into this major one. Because this major one has the, you know, it is the geopolitical um, importance of uh, being at the intersection of these two major uh, pilgrimage and trade routes. So this was also the place where a lot of the tribal clans and the rulers not all of them were tribal. The tribes would gather at one point, but then the Rajput clans came, they replaced the tribes. I'm not going into the Uttarakhand history to such a huge extent because I would like to focus on Pithoragar and on Mosk Manu, but uh, I just wanted to flag this with you that this was a gathering place for the tribal clans. Um, and uh, and these people, the clans built fortified settlements of their own on hilltops around the town. Uh, these for, little forts, they were called forts. And uh, now we have the remains of just one or two, but there were many more uh, earlier. So these little fortified settlements belonged to each of the tribal clan or the clan group when they would gather in this valley to have their, uh, you know, um, their regular meetings and uh, their uh, interactions, which they did from time to time. Some of the richer tribal chieftains also built mansions called nolas. Now, uh, I'm sure Anjali and others who are working on uh, uh, Uttarakhand uh, are familiar with this term. These nolas are mansions uh, and for me, the area of interest is that they have these underground water systems. They have, they are, most of them have underground water tanks uh, for storage and collection of water. So in um, in um, Pithoragar, we Rani Ka Nola and Hart Ka Nola are some examples of these old mansions. Most of them are run down. These two are the only ones. All good? Yes, all good. Okay. So, uh, once again, I emphasize that Pithoragarh was an important nodal center of trade in the early medieval and medieval period, and perhaps before that as well. This is shown by the presence of a large number of coins. Uh, there are, I uh, had the good fortune of meeting a local historian who's a, uh, uh, you know, numismatics aficionado, uh, Dr. Madan Chandra Bhatt, and he showed me that he has a personal collection of uh, coins. Uh, there, there are Tibetan coins, uh, there are medieval Nepali coins, and there are, there's Mughal currency as well. 
so uh, the presence of uh, you know a large availability of a large number of coins again reinforces the importance of trade to this town the town is laid out like a typical ancient trading center you know uh, many uh, fortified cities whether you go to rajasthan whether you even look at delhi or even you uh, you can look at patiala or punjab uh the fortified the, the walled cities usually have a particular morphology so you will have streets and neighborhoods uh, that are specializing in particular crafts and pithoragarh is no exception almora has a similar layout as well uh you have uh, you know streets of uh, you know uh, artisans who manufacture particular crafts like silver and gold ornaments uh, metal and wooden utensils wooden utensils are a very uh, typical craft of uh, of pithoragarh and uh, apparently they use it the wooden pot to make uh, curds in so i found that quite interesting um, there's stone work there's carpentry uh, then even in the surrounding villages you had a lot of craft uh you had bhoj patra or tree bark manuscripts they were a specialized industry literally in the surrounding villages now uh, unfortunately it's almost extinct uh, but again this uh, dr madan chandra bhat told me about this and he says the ink uh, manufacture of the ink was an important industry of pithoragarh as well so that was that was pretty interesting Pithoragarh I mentioned earlier is believed to have been established on a rice field. Grain was produced in abundance and was an important item of trade with Nepal and Tibet. Gourd you know the raw sugar uh sugar and salt are still popular items of trade. In addition the hill tribes like the Shaukas, Bhutias, Rangs and Vandravas uh traded in food grains in exchange for woolen fabric they would manufacture woolen fabrics and then exchange them for food grain and other uh, items of daily use so the tribes as i had mentioned earlier because of their movement because of their pastoralism and transhumance the practice of moving to the upper regions in uh, summer and then coming down to the lower slopes in winter because of this they were constantly moving and uh, also that facilitated their trading activities at present i mean this is uh, this is a contemporary uh, situation uh, towns like gunji dharchula julaghat and joljibi are important centers of trade with nepal and china products exported to china include gourd uh tobacco mishri and needles for some reason i have no idea why the chinese or maybe the tibetans uh, want needles from india but uh, that is one of the a popular item of trade that goes through the shaukas and bhutias even today imports from china of course what would one expect uh, they include cosmetics carpets suede shoes for some reason and electronic items so these are the imports that come in but uh, there's a lot of gourd and sugar that goes to china so i think uh, india is a very sweet country and uh, maybe our export of gourd and sugar are a sweet stuff is pretty popular even in china pithoragarh's importance as a pilgrimage center is illustrated by the presence of several temples Kapileshwar Rameshwar at the confluence of the Sariyu and the Ramganga Arjuneshwar Nakuleshwar Vasisht Ashram and a cave temple at Dunsera actually there are more cave temples uh, because uh, uh, you know one sees in typically in the surrounding hills uh, there are caves and uh, you know before uh, the free standing temples began to be built uh, in the medieval period uh you had the practice of uh, building cave temples um so that is something about pithoragarh and giving you the larger urban context of uh, of the place 
Now let's look at uh, the most Manu temple. How are we doing for time? Ma'am, don't worry about time. Just take your time. We are all here. Okay. All right. Thank you. So about six kilometers from Pithoragarh, you find the village of Chandak. Chandak is named after the goddess Chandika. And it is in Chandak that you find the temple of Most Manu. It is also alternatively called the Sheshnag temple because uh, apparently till about 25, 30 years ago, there was a pool of water there where there were a lot of snakes. Uh, the pool is now dry. Um, so it used to be called on or called the Sheshnag temple on account of that pool of snakes. The temple site is very significant as it overlooks an important snow-capped peak that is known locally as Meru Parvat. Now you can see the uh, reference to, uh, you know, the kind of a, uh, an attempt to link with, uh, with Puranic mythology uh, by calling uh, this, I mean, it seemed like a random snow-capped peak to me. It was very beautiful, but uh, this, uh, they, they called it Meru Parvat. So it's very interesting. They said that uh, you have the appearance of the divine. Devta appears, they told me, uh, when there is a convergence of ecological factors. Uh, water, forests, and mountains. Uh, this is an important aspect of its sacred geography. You need to be able to see the mountains, right? And uh, this was really, it was actually uh, really interesting because uh, the temple trust had gone and built an absolutely hideous uh, um, building uh, right next to, just behind the temple that completely interfered with the visual integrity of you. I mean, you could not get a clear view of the peak of that Meru Parvat. So I asked them, I said, Ye kyo bana diya yaan pe? it was a, supposedly a guest house. No? I said, Koi aur jaga nahi aap, aap ko mili. you didn't find any other place. I'm sorry, I'm lapsing into Hindi a little. Does that bother? Anyway, I'll try to stick to it. No, you, you can be uh, bilingual. This is a very open word. Right, I'll, I'll yeah. translate. I'll translate. So I said that, you know, didn't you find any other place to build uh, this... Uh, <laughs> this guest house, you know, because it interferes with uh, your view of your Meru Parvat, which is a sacred view and reinforces the sacred geography of the place. I mean, if you don't, if, if, if that view gets interrupted, then you lose out on one of the, uh, you know, sacred aspects of the, of the temple uh, tradition. Uh, this is, it's actually very interesting, this whole uh, conglomeration of these ecological factors. I have encountered this in many other places. I've worked in Maharashtra a uh, considerable extent. And this notion of Jal, Jungle and Pahar, the convergence of these three factors, they say that Devta, the, 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 the divine, uh, makes an appearance when these three factors converge. So I found a similar situation here too. And I was, uh, I was quite delighted uh, to see that uh, you know that was kind of a um, you know congruent with other theories and other places that I had uh, experienced. So its sacred geography is uh, you know well delineated in terms of uh, you know the of the ecological context of the of the place. So the origin myth of the temple is something like this: Where did this deity come from? You know? Apparently, a pilgrim from Pithoragarh went to Pashupatinath in Nepal for their annual pilgrimage. While he was there, he acquired a grinding stone. Grinding stone is what the silbatta when you grind spices. You know? So he wanted a grinding stone to grind spices for his meals. While returning, he set up camp for the night at the spot where the temple is now located. The next morning when he picked up his luggage and tried to move from the place and to resume his journey, 
he realized that the grinding stone had become so heavy that it could not be moved he tried a lot but just couldn't budge it so then believing that it was possessed by a divine power he left it in the hands of local brahmins over the next few days uh, members of a particular family called bisht their names were bisht bisht is a typical brahmin surname in uh, that part of uttarakhand so the members of the bisht family in the neighboring village uh, began to show signs of possession by a divine spirit of the deity apparently the deity told them that he wanted to be installed at this very spot the deity told them he had come from nepal from across uh, you know the mountains and wanted to be installed in this very spot so the deity communicated uh, by possessing uh, members of this uh, family the divine stone was installed in the temple a temple was built of course uh, nobody knows the date of this particular uh, event i mean as i said earlier i have have not really gone into archival histories records and so on so all that i'm telling you is based on local folklore and uh, community accounts so the uh, the stone was installed in the shrine which was constructed around it uh, the shrine could be is fairly old it is definitely more than 300 years old Uh, this was told to me by our uh, conservation architect team who were working on conservation of the temple now the deity uh, who who told uh, this uh, this family that his name was he told told them his name which was mosta devta or most manu as he is called uh, he missed other members of his family apparently and so they were brought as in stone form and installed around this deity so uh, they form what is called a dev kul so other members of his family are called bala ji lata ji pashupati nath and kalika devi the sisters believed to be kalika devi interestingly uh, kalika devi is an autochthonous stone that has apparently sprouted out of the ground they showed me this phenomenon uh, they said the stone has come up out of the ground and uh, i could not find a scientific or a geographical process for this uh, it could be all here say um, it could be a stone that had been buried and then because of freezing and unfreezing of the ground possibly some parts of it would have become exposed so that is uh, for later scientists to discover what this process is of stones appearing out of the ground but that is kalika devi she is an autochthonous uh, goddess that has come up spontaneously uh, out of the ground uh, in that place and of course a myth was created that she wanted to be near her brother so she rose out of the ground erupted out of the ground so together these five deities are the dev kul uh, the they they are the divine family uh, in of most manu in um, there are a lot of beliefs local beliefs uh, there is a lot of significance to these sites uh, the local communities believe that in times of drought uh, um, a major yagya um, fire sacrifice is performed at the temple which invariably results in rainfall or a bumper har and and a bumper harvest so mosta devta as the deity is locally known has been known to appear to the village community from time to time in a physical form people speak of a tall soldierly figure wearing armor a helmet and boots appearing out of the mist on dark nights apparently travelers along those uh, mountain paths have seen this um, 
this uh, soldier appearing out of the mist. Community members say that the deity settled in this place to protect it from war and natural disasters, knowing that it was vulnerable to them. The description of helmet and boots, uh, according to the local community, also affirmed uh, his foreign identity. They say that, you know, people uh, from Nepal, uh, uh, soldiers from Nepal dress like this. So either it is uh, part of a collective memory of, uh, of the time when uh, this, was, this area was actually included in the Nepal kingdom in the medieval period, um, 15th, 16th, 17th century onwards, uh, or uh, it is hearsay, you know, it is uh, just a conceptual thing. But they, he apparently wears this helmet and boots, oh. and uh, his uh, and his uh, job appears to be to protect. So he is a, a deity who protects the local uh, uh, region and the community. The motif of family or devkul is very important in the most Manu tradition. It is believed that the Devata missed his family, so their representatives in the form of stones were uh, brought and installed around his image, as I mentioned. But in addition to that, uh, there are temples on the surrounding hilltops. So when uh, most Manu is on a higher reach of the ground, as you drive up from Pithoragar reach, before you hit Chandak village, you have a a, you know, a, a hillock and the temple is on the hillock, but all around you have these other hills which have, many of which have temples on the hilltop. Um, so those temples are, uh, some of them are called Ashurtul, Gokarneshwar, Vaishnavi Devi and Kalika, another Kalika temple. And they are also ritually linked to most Manu and part of the Devkul. And I'm going to just get into the reasons for that, the possible reasons for that a little later. The bringing together of diverse settlements through a ritual connection with the temple establishes the dominance of Mosta Devta over the region, right? So when they, are, they form the Devkul, then Mosta Devta becomes the head of that Devkul, as it were and there, thereby establishing his influence uh, and his dominance over the region as well. So this is a ritual connection that can also have political undertones. This, uh, this whole system of reciprocity between temples and institutions and settlements is reaffirmed through annual festivals and uh, fairs and events. So, for example, a large annual fair or a mela is held at Most Manu Temple on Rish Panchmi or Nag Panchmi in September, probably around now. Um, you'll have that uh, Most Manu Mela, which is very popular uh, in the local area. About uh, almost a lakh of people now uh, attend the Most Manu uh, Mela, and which it goes on for three or four days. And during the fair, uh, there are ritual specialists called Jagars, and they are possessed by the spirits of the deity. So these Jagars are almost like, like shamans or uh, they, they're professional uh, community which uh, specializes in possession. So these Jagars uh, get possessed by the spirits of the deities, and then in that state, they answer questions that are posed to them by the public or they solve problems, uh, family issues, people can't have children, blah, blah, uh, and they, you know, they address those kind of uh, issues. So this is a very important aspect of the, uh, of the Mela. What? Oh, right. It's okay. Okay. Right. Sorry. Thank you for reminding me. This is the most Manu temple. As you can see, it's a very modern structure, and uh, uh, you know, all these are. Th this is not under the Archaeological Survey of India, uh, and it's uh, you know, it's not protected. So it has been undergone various changes, um, especially in recent times. It's a very small, tiny temple, 
and this is the this is the front view of the entrance to the temple So this is a maidan in front of the temple. Uh, this is where uh, you have performances. That little uh, pavilion that you see, uh, it's a terrible looking, uh, very modern building. Although earlier they say it used to be a temporary shed-like structure made of wood. But of course now they have installed uh, bathroom tiles everywhere. So uh, that has been modernized. Um, and uh, that is where performances take place uh, during uh, the annual fair. And there are troops that come, of artists that come from Haldwani, Lohagat, Almora, big cities, you know. And uh, loads of shops uh, along the routes to the temple are set up, and a uh, lot of food is sold. The food items, the favorite food items, I was told are jalebis, pakoris, and alu karata. They are very extremely popular for some reason. Now there's a tall swing in the open maidan outside the temple that you can see right now. It is believed that the wishes of those who swing on it are answered. And uh, you know, typically you have women uh, swim, uh, swinging on the, on the swing. It's really unusually tall, as you can see. I, I, I did swing on it when I was there and also uh, had a couple of wishes and I won't say whether they were answered or not. But uh, it's an amazing experience to swing on this swing. It's really tall and, uh, you know, it, it has a very long loop, like a pendulum that goes back and forth. So just to recap now, the Most Manu tradition exemplifies definitely a local tribal cult, which has a peripheral link with the great tradition. Uh, I'm not uh, using a value loaded term here. I'm talking of uh, Srinivas's uh, classification of great and little uh, tradition. The great tradition of Brahmanical Hinduism. The Pithoragar region is heavily populated by hill tribes engaged in pastoralism and trade. Their belief in animistic objects like stones and spirits appear to be reflected in the worship of Mostumanu. Mostumanu's close association with local communities, its autochthonous stone images and the repeated motif of the Devkul or family uh, in its worship resonates more with clan-based tribal society and less with orthodox Hindu temple rituals. The practice of possession by divine spirits, which is enacted by the Jagars at the annual Mela, also emphasizes the tradition's link with pre-Brahmanical tribal worship of ancestors and natural forces. The association with Pashupati Nath and Nepal, from where the deity traveled in the form of a mundane household object, like a grinding stone, indicates strong linkages of networks of pilgrimage and movement of people along pilgrimage routes. It may also indicate the political spread of Nepal's authority in the region in medieval times. So this area uh, could was in fact under the political dominance of the Nepal dynasty. The Brahms of Nepal, which are now uh, called the Bum, uh, they, they are definitely a dynasty from Nepal. The significance of the Brahmin Pujari performing rituals in the temple, as well as the inclusion of the local Bisht community who are Brahmins who advocated the installation of the deity at the temple site seems to indicate the appropriation of a tribal cult by Brahmanical Hinduism. Such appropriation seems to be limited in nature, however. And most Manu retains his tribal animistic moorings despite such appropriation. Thank you very much. I'll end with that. Thank you.
thank you so much for that wonderful talk uh, uh, yamini ji that was really uh, interesting to see how uh, this deity kind of adapts and how the people kind of uh, adapt around it and we see this in small hamlets all over the himalayas and for you to kind of focus on the point that the himalayas are not obstructions but actually they are passageways where all this amalgamation is happening and it's very important to see right. them see them that way so um, right. um we have questions and i it would be great if uh, at this point uh, all of you would kind of raise your hands so i can take the questions in the order i receive them because if you write there is on, uh, there are there are questions in the group chat we yeah. can address those if you like yeah that's what Shall i wanted we... actually i wanted the people who have asked the questions actually uh, uh verbalize them and ask them themselves because that's we want this forum to be interactive instead of just me reading them out uh okay. so those of you who um are not shy can you please I raise your hands to see deeper the nyana fragrance is divine okay um so maybe i need to call out the names because it's kind of difficult for me to scroll up and read the questions again um the only thing we could really have is hmm if you could just give me a minute and i'll just scroll up okay uh somebody has raised so there is a tab on the uh, zoom application where you can raise the hand but i know that somebody has uh, anita ji you can uh, unmute yourself and ask the question please thank you so much um, thank you yamini for this wonderful talk on uh, the most manu a temple and shrine in uh, pithoragarh i was just wondering you mentioned that it was a grinding stone that i mean that's the legend it grew so heavy that uh, you know it was impossible to lift it does it look like a grinding stone the deity does it, it look looked like, like a, a silbatta it looked like a stone i'm so sorry that uh, we out of respect for the pujari we did not take photographs uh, inside of the um, stone itself uh, i mm -hmm. think he was a little bit although he was you know trying to he didn't want to antagonize us and you know how it is the dynamic between uh, the local community member who feels a little diffident but i think he he just wasn't happy if we took photographs of the deity so i don't have a photograph of the stone it wasn't large at all it was about it was about this big oh, and it was it? black oh, it was black uh, and uh, uh, it it could be granite you know i I don't have such a knowledge of stone, but it was rounded like a shali ground. It was not completely smooth. It was a little bit uh, karera, you know. It was a little. I was, uh, you know, Yamini. I was wondering. I was saying, is it like a lingam, or is it? So, I mean, I was just no. curious to it know. Was, no, it's not. It was not. It was not. It was first of all laid out sideways. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. It's not upright. Yeah. Okay. yeah it was not upright uh, some of the stones were upright some of them were but uh, i uh, of course there is a tendency uh, in some of members of the local community to try and bring in that comparison with shiva especially because there is water and the snakes and there is mountains so that seems to be a no brainer bringing in the uh, uh, and the story uh, about the pashupati nath trip and all right. of that you know there's right. too much that sort of try, you know connecting yeah. with uh, the greater tradition yeah. so i was just wondering yeah uh, but you know uh, i i that's what i wanted to emphasize that uh, those sort of uh, th there is an those links with the great <laughs> tradition become a little labored you know you tend to uh trying to force those links ke okay, this is a form of shiva why do we need to do that it's a local cult it's a grinding stone <laughs> it's a spirit that is entered the grinding stone and let's leave it at that that's what the people believe uh now you may have some uh, you know people from people usually who come in from outside and then they say that okay no no this is actually a form of shiva and then they go and they write a puran about it <laughs> uh, or they add it to the skand quran uh, one of the chapters but the point is that it is in fact a local cult. a tribal tradition yeah. yeah 
and even thank here, you. thank you so much. And even here yeah. in the Kulu Valley, in the Western Himalayas, a lot of uh, Devi and Devtas are personified in the form of stones. Um, and uh, not all of them look like uh, the lingams. Uh, some of them are fixed with eyes because our concept of darshan is there. So do, do the, right. does this stone have eyes on it or something that kind of uh, fixes the gaze? No, it doesn't. No anthropomorphic uh, signs on it. Okay. It's not no attempt at anthropomorphization. It's actually really a very tiny temple. Uh, the the space inside, you know, these uh, these hill temples of Uttarakhand, they can be really tiny. Mm -hmm. Even the one in Mukteshwar, where my where my mother lives, uh, the, it's a it's a old and very eminent and very significant temple of Mukteshwar Mahadev, which is clearly. Uh, Shaivite uh, shrine. I've seen it. Um, I've seen but, it. Right. So even that shrine actually is very small inside, you know. Uh, and the most Manu one is equally tiny. There's not much space at all. Uh, not more than two people or three people or two people plus the pujari can sit and do a small puja there. That's about. It. And another very interesting thing before I take the next two questions is when you talk about the family, the associated family. This is a common thing that uh, we see in the Himalayas, uh, in of course central right. and western Himalayas, where all these associations, one is a sister, a consort, and this whole family is constructed. And I almost feel that, um, you know, when we talk about the uh, greater uh, uh, pantheon of the Hindus, and then this need for uh, creating a smaller pantheon, just as a reflection of what's going on on a smaller scale, you know, creating that whole family. Uh, you know. Uh, again, Sonali, I would tend to not uh, really link up with the uh, larger Hindu, Quranic Hinduism with the whole, uh, although they have, I mean, the, the, the example of uh, the divine family par excellence uh, that you find is in Jagannath Puri, right? You have the two brothers and the sister. And that has been really deeply, ritually uh, linked with uh, with the Puranic, uh, you know, pantheon. But in fact, it is a tribal deity. Jagannath is a tribal deity. No, so, I totally uh, agree with that, uh, that, you uh, know, these are tribal deities. But as time uh, uh, passes on, and this need no. of integrating with the pan-Hindu uh, concept, which comes much right. later. So this integration Absolutely. happens to get the, you know, the one devtas, which are the, these tribal deities with the, uh, you know, right. the gun, the, the larger thing for acceptability to get integrated into that mainstream thing eventually. Right. Well, you're being very kind and calling it integration. I mean, I'm from JNU, so uh, I, I'm i rather blunt about these things. It's appropriation, mm -hmm. uh, literally, uh, of uh, local cults. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, it's okay. It's part of this, uh, of a cultural spread that took place. Uh, it's tied in with a lot of political developments, the establishment of kingdoms, state formation, uh, you know, uh, which is why, uh, again, going back to uh, the Urissa case, uh, a lo popular local cult was, uh, you know, given greater credence by uh, Anantavarman Choda Ganga Deva, who built the temple of Jagannath in 1147, as we know it which continues to this day. Mm -hmm. So uh, this was very much a part of political legitimacy uh, seeking by uh, local rulers. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it, it was uh, to a large extent appropriation and then establishing ritual linkages between temple and state. Yeah, that's true. And also, uh, and I'll talk about the Western Himalayas, where we see, you know, this whole Brahmanical tradition of having Brahmins as priests comes in much later. Right. It comes in much right. later. And, Absolutely. Uh, and I have to like give, this is something that has happened in front of me, you know, um, uh, in the past 30 years, somebody in the village, they were excavating. And, you know, these, um, uh, the caste system is very, very prevalent in these smaller areas. You know, in the urban areas, we might not realize it, but in smaller areas, you know, they are, um, uh, people can even be, be ostracized for flouting the rules. So there was this temple that was ex uh, 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 um, just discovered by a villager 
and they clamped on uh, to the thing that, oh, this belongs to our uh, deity. And it was a low caste village and the, uh, the temple was open for all. It had no shaman, no priest. But gradually, the people from the higher uh, village, they uh, forced a Brahmin priest to that temple in right. an effort to, I guess, appropriate the whole history of right. it. So we right. see it even today. So I do agree right. with you about appropriation. But uh, yeah, maybe I was calling integration from the point of view of others. <laughs> yeah. That's fine. That's yeah. fine. Okay. Yeah, that's so, fine. So let's have the next question. Uh, we have, uh, just a second, um, let me just bring it up. We have uh, Dr. Vijay Lakshmi Bose. So if you could uh, uh, take on the mic, ma'am. Yeah. Sorry, it took me a while. Uh, that was very interesting. And I'm a dilettante. I have uh, no knowledge of anthropology, a very vague knowledge of folkloristics. Um, but I would like to share with you uh, that uh, where I, I spend a lot of time in Dehradun, and in the forests of Dehradun, there is this stone that is worshipped as Bhadra Kali, Bhadra form of Kali. And uh, it's anthropomorphic, it has features. But again, it was uh, worshipped initially by the women, but now worshipped by the Brahmanical tradition. But interestingly enough, she also possesses. So I document that area quite a bit. I do it through stories. And I have a story of possession. What I wanted to ask you was, ma'am, uh, what kind of fairs are held and what kind of living traditions are there in dance and song? Are they more Nepali than Pitmoragari or what influence of the mountains? You could tell us a little bit about that. We're only out of it. Thank you. Um, that's, that's a great question, Vijay Lakshmiji, and thank you for asking that. Uh, I'm not so knowledgeable about uh, about the dance and music traditions. I believe currently uh, most of the troops that come to this uh, Most Manu Fair are popular troops uh, from, as I mentioned, from Haldwani and uh, you know other places, Loha Ghat and so on, um, and even from Almora. They are usually some of them are folk dancers and they perform. Again, I'm not that knowledgeable about uh, Uttarakhand folk dances, I'm sorry to say. Uh, but they perform mainly folk dances, but a lot of it is they do Bollywood numbers and, you know, which people want to see. Uh, so it's very much, uh, you know, it's... Uh, we had proposed actually as part of this tourism project to actually uh, showcase uh, a lot more of Uttarakhand uh, culture and the music traditions and so on. Uh, let's see, let's see if that uh, happens. But right now it's at a very basic level. Uh, it's, uh, but the crowds are simply growing. I mean, it was, uh, it was 80,000 one year and the next year we were continuing working and it rose to one lakh and you know, the local government was really, uh, so, so it's becoming, you see, what happens is with the growth of numbers like this, uh, these destinations become very popular uh, for local troops to perform in, right? I mean, uh, there's, more, there's more money involved and then you have bigger and bigger troops. They, they may even call a troop, uh, you know, from, uh, from Delhi or Lucknow or something like that uh, uh, to perform. So these, these kind of things, I mean, the most Manu Mela was definitely growing in scope and size. Yeah, I know Anjali, I don't know whether Anjali is there, but Anjali's work is mainly to document songs around the Ganga. And she's finding that over the years, there's been a lot of attrition. In fact, women are singing less and less. The younger people have gone on to uh, DJs. I see the same right. in the part of Uttarakhand that I live in. Right, You're absolutely right. Thank you. Thank you for the Okay, before I take the next question, uh, we have a question on the chat window by uh, Dr. Aniket Alam. And Aniket is not able to ask this question because he's in a place that has a lot of noise. So I'm asking it on his behalf. So Aniket okay. asks, uh, he wants to know if there are other idols which have metal masks, uh, like the Mohras in the Western Himalayas. Um, and how do the British records report on this? 
And is there a change in the way the British reports change over time? So if you know, I, I don't know whether you um, saw uh, Aniket's lecture, uh, and I highly recommend that you do it in the YouTube. Uh, basically, he sees how reporting of the census also change. You know, it has a lot to do like how they perceive traditions and how it actually was. So if you could answer that. Uh, I'm going to disappoint Aniket, uh, and uh, I'm sorry, Aniket, I have not looked, uh, as I told you, this is more uh, an anecdotal uh, account of my own experience of this place. I have not gone into the British records. I have not even looked at the gazetteers. So uh, I'm afraid my, I, uh, my sources on this uh, are his historically not very sound at the moment. Um, but uh, uh, about the masks, there are no masks, not in this temple. Okay, so I take on the next question. Uh, Jenny, yeah. uh, if you could ask this question, Jenny is our regular and she's tuned in from Princeton. So if you could ask the question. Uh, hi, hi everyone. Hi, Sonali. Hi, thank you for the opportunity to be here again. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, how far back do you date the first appearance of this stone? And, and who were the tribal, what was the tribal culture at the time? Okay, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, most of my, all my information in fact is anecdotal and it is based on interactions with the local communities. So they cannot give uh, give dates and uh, you know exact historical uh, facts like that. Uh, most probably, this is uh, uh, the, the as I told you, the temple, uh, the oldest parts of the current shrine, which is one of the ways we can get of at least trying to date uh, the cult. Although the cult can be much older than the temple. So that is, it's not a, uh, you know, uh, it, it's not a, something that would affirm a particular date. But the temple is definitely uh, 15th, 16th centuries at least. This was, uh, this was told to us by our conservation, our uh, specialist, the architects who worked on the structure. So the inside of the temple, which you cannot see from the photographs outside, are uh, at least 15th, 16th centuries in their oldest current part. But it's a very small, simple and basic shrine. So it has clearly not been built by any uh, royal dynasty. It has not been built by any major king. Uh, not a lot of money has gone into the building of it. So it is clearly a very, uh, it, it's a, it's a community-based shrine as well. So uh, I would say that it's not possible to date the cult at the moment. Uh, and all the information that we have is from, uh, all the information that I have is from local community sources. So I'm sorry that I have a limited answer for you, but that's all I can say at the moment. Okay. Thank Yamini, you. Yamini ji, I wanted to ask you, have you uh, explored like photo, old photographs of the shrine that people may have? Uh, because that's what I'm currently doing uh, for the temples that are in uh, the Kulu Valley. I'm looking at old photographs and sketches. The oldest, the oldest photograph that we had of, that we managed to get of Most Manu was not very old at all. It was from the 1970s. Uh, that is when uh, that is when these uh, uh, currently plastered structures were open face brick. So we uh, so that is the only and that but those structures were still there. Those structures that you see outside the temple. But uh, have you explored the village? Uh, like um, uh, people who live in the village, maybe you know, like it's always uh, I've seen in lo local areas they always want to pose in front of their favorite temple. Um, so have you seen, have you kind of explored the village and asked people? We have, we have, we have not, we have not, uh, I'm sorry, Sonali, we were not able to go into a lot of detail about Most Manu. We managed to only do it, uh, do a little bit of detailing on Pithoragar, but 
we could not go into as much detail on most manu as we wanted what we really wanted was to look at land records in the village because there are some aspects of the land ownership uh, apparently the land on which the temple is located was donated uh, by the local village community which is what prompted us to realize that probably the temple uh, structure of the shrine is also a community effort and not uh, it is not part of a royal grant a land grant or anything like that we don't and, have and who owns land. the land the community owns the land there is a trust now okay there is a trust that owns uh, the land so uh, but that will of course set up later okay and aniket asks when was the land donated by the village community do you have uh, any information on I that i can check maybe somewhere in my record i may have that land was also donated well before 3 or 400 years i can see if i have any notes on that okay and before i take sashi ji's question uh, rabindra hazari has a question for you where he asks uh, he compliments you for a fascinating lecture and says do you have conflicts between deities identified with different castes as you have in south kanara and udupi districts in coastal karnataka and other places do you have dalit deities in uttarakhand junior i'm not uh, i'm not i'm sure there are dalit deities in uttarakhand i haven't worked on any uh you see what happens typically is that uh, most of these sites that one ends up uh, working on at least i that i end up working on are those that are associated with um, you know bodies like the asi or uh, the state department of uh, archaeology and so on most of these are uh, larger temple complexes in fact most manu was one of the tiniest uh, temple complexes and it just it was almost a coincidence that we got to work on most manu it was just that uh, pithoragarh is a border district there was uh, it was, there was a programmatic objective of working on the border district uh, and the adb was interested in this uh, in its idipt uh, project the infrastructure development project so it was almost a coincidence that we ended up working on most manu otherwise we would work on uh, you know jageshwar and these kind of uh, complexes that are closer to almora and so on uh, where you don't see the presence of uh, so much of dalit deities having said that uh it would be interesting to look at some of the yatras like the naina devi uh, yatra which takes place uh, in nenital for example uh, and look at the involvement and the absorption of uh, deities of different castes you know uh, actually to be very honest uttarakhand is not my uh, uh, area of focus at all i've <laughs> spent my life working on odisha and now a lot in uh, marathwada but so uh, the uttarakhand experience uh, was uh, you know just happened just sort of happened um, but i did feel that it was something worth highlighting and it was a story that needed to be told and i hope i mean one lifetime for me is proving to be uh, not enough to work on as many places uh, as i would like i really want to work on this community this devpul and the links between the other settlements like beri nag and uh, uh, so on that i was gangoli hart and so on that, that i was talking about building the trade routes the trade corridors but i don't know when i'll be able to do something like that yeah sorry you you have another question uh, oh there's unmute another. yourself unmute yourself he is not unmuting himself Yes, okay. hello. Can you hear me now? Yeah, uh, very faintly. Okay. My my question, you know, you you had this very interesting point about uh, earlier tribal deities being taken over by Brahmin uh, migration from upper caste villages. So, do you have any uh, evidence of resistance to these kind of takeovers? Because in South Canara, for example. you have a pitched battles between dalit deities bhuta worship that is ghost worship spirit worship 
which is a form of uh, lower caste rebellion against uh, Brahmin orthodoxy. So, uh, At, especially yeah. to, uh, so do you see any similar trends here of resistance to upper caste takeovers? Actually, uh, there is a lot of lot more work that has been done in the south uh, in the uh, temples that you are referring to. There's been a lot, and there's a lot more awareness uh, of uh, the, of this aspect uh, than there is. Uh, I'm not aware of uh, uh, in the areas of Uttarakhand, particularly Kumau, which I'm more familiar with. Uh, I'm not aware of organized uh, resistance. To some extent, when you have deities like Golu Devta, uh, Golu Devta is more like a local hero stone, which has assumed uh, you know, the dimensions of now a, almost a full-fledged deity. But Golu Devta, I suspect, began like a hero stone, like a Viragal, you know, of that area. So uh, I'm guessing that, uh, you know, Golu Devta would be a case in point because he is associated with pastoralist communities. Um, and uh, it, uh, there is some conflict and contestation with the land owning communities, which I suspect is more political than uh, so much caste, than caste based. It's more about power. It's more about political power uh, and uh, control over land, the pasture lands versus the agricultural land. Uh, so the that story, that's a famous story of Kumau. Um, but uh, I mean, of course, in the case of uh, of the uh, of the Jagannath Temple, we have uh, clearly, uh, you know not organized resistance, but that resistance has become almost ritualized. So within the temple of Jagannath, you have a very specialized group of uh, what are called tribal priests. They're supposed to be priests of tribal origin. They're called Daita Patis. Daita means tribe uh, in the local language. So those, uh, those guys, uh, there's almost an organized and, uh, you know, on certain occasions, they tend to sort of take away the deity and control the deity and don't allow the Brahmanical priests access to the deity. Uh, but that is, you know, like what uh, Dr. Gupta, uh, what Sonali was mentioning is more an integrative thing than actually a form of uh, resistance. There's also during the Rath Yatra, uh, as typically happens in these sort of ritual processions, uh, there is uh, there are various elements, uh, including elements of resistance through songs, uh, through uh, shouting curses and role play, uh, you know, sexual in innuendos uh, that come up in these kind of functions. So I wouldn't know, to be honest. I have not attended the most Manu fair. Uh, I don't know if in most Manu uh, you would find uh, elements of that aspect. But certainly the Jagars are a very interesting uh, community. The Jagars are, uh, you know, for want of any better comparison, uh, they are like shamans. And uh, they, are, uh, they are clearly, they are not, they're not Brahmanical. In fact, they are not uh, of any high caste uh, whatsoever. Uh, th those are the guys who take on the spirits of the deity. So it would be interesting to go into what is their background. So sorry, I've been all over the place and come back to this. And to add on to that, add on to that in the Western Himalayas, uh, we have uh, the Gurs who are all mostly from the low caste, though the monopoly of having um, the Gur or the Shaman, for lack of a better word, um, they can be uh, Brahmin, uh, Brahmin shamans as well as, uh, you know, the ones from the low caste. But when you ritually see them uh, 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 working out what they're supposed to be, the spokesperson of the deities, the ones from the lower caste, the lower caste shaman cannot get into the sanctum sanctorum. That's not allowed. They know that. Even in a state of trance, they do not do that. Having said that, so we see the low caste and the high caste kind of uh, 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 dynamic there. But also, there are some temples where the Rajputs are the priests, not the Brahmins, but the Rajputs. 
and this is a, a, a very famous temple parashar rishi of course parashar rishi is a very mythical uh, figure uh, in the epics and a lot of these uh, sages from uh, the myths are here present in the western himalayas and they are served by the rajput priests so it's very interesting how the um, uh, how this changes you know it it necessarily doesn't always have to be a brahmanical priest it can be a low caste person or high caste but then they kind of uh, organize it in a way that you don't question it it's about balancing the equation right and uh, yeah so we'll take the next question from uh, sashi ji if you could take on the mic and then we'll have aman and then we'll have jenny so is sashi sashi ji uh, there if you could take your question can you hear me now yes okay uh, you had my, that was a lovely interesting lecture uh, i want to have uh, one doubt clear you mentioned that uh, uh, some of the temples are related to kerala and uh, one of the temples has uh, is linked to the pashupatinath temple at uh, nepal now i want to know right. i guess with the passage of time the ties with uh, kerala might have been snapped completely but since pithorgad is on the route to uh, ma kailash manasarovar and therefore of nepal are the links between the temples still strong do they follow the pasupati nath temple calendar do they follow any of the similar rites are similar festivals being held is there any connection still between the pashupatina temple and uh, this temple uh as i had mentioned earlier apart from the fact that one of the deities of the um, family of mostumanu uh he is actually the deity, the stone is called pashupatina mm. so you have these five uh, family members of his mm. uh, four family members and himself Uh, so you have balaji lata ji pashupati nath and uh, kalika devi and uh, that is actually pretty much uh, the only obvious link with pashupati nath other than the origin myths in which the pilgrim went uh, to pashupati nath on pilgrimage mm-hmm. okay. uh, and got the stone back from there so other than that you know the uh, ritual calendar of pashupati nath does not reflect i mean it's not like uh, there is an organic link maybe it okay. was there at some point and is now broken so uh, at at the moment the main festival is this mela that takes place annually thank you that was interesting thank you thank you thank you and now we have aman uh with his question if you could take over the mic please yeah sure uh is i audible to all yes yeah okay uh my question is uh, actually my name is aman and i am working on western himalayan region and uh, i am also resident of the uh, this shimla district and uh, and my kul devta is mahasu devta and i have uh, i have uh, uh, done uh my research in this region so uh, my question is that uh, these local gods that uh, in the all himalayan region in the whole himalayan region is changing uh, uh, its uh, practices like practices due to uh, like uh, uh, due to change in the bo- uh, modern nation state like you close off the border with the in the western himalaya like with tibet right. or that so there are so many uh, new many practices are also coming up mm. like they are, they have also identified their new roles like mahasu has identified its new roles in the local uh, in setup so i want to know if you have done any ethnographic work with this deity uh, mostmanu particularly with mostmanu and the in the local in this region how this they have changed this deity has changed its role with the local people and uh, with the others like uh, uh, locals of the pithoragad like tongs so i, I want to know about it. you know aman i don't see uh, uh, i have not as i told you most of my uh, information was through uh, local discussions conversations with uh, local communities and so on uh, 
one of the reasons i found uh, most manu uh, really fascinating was that it seemed to me to be uh, you know relatively i mean i know how political temples are i've uh, worked on some of the biggest temples in the country uh this one seemed to be to me to be uh, not so influenced or relatively not influenced by uh, a lot of you know local politi- uh, or a, a lot of at least national level po- uh, political changes now yes of course uh, there is uh, maybe this could be because uh, most of my field work i did in 2012 and 13 uh which is when uh, we didn't have uh, you know such a problem uh, with either nepal or with china so the kailash mansarovar yatra was moving and the border with nepal was also relatively you know trade was going on uh so we have uh, and especially with nepal we have had uh, relatively you know uh, it, it, the trade has been it's been fairly open i mean the trade has been continuous at a small scale of course uh, through the tribes and through and the pilgrimage to pashupatinath also carries on the border with nepal is much less problematic than the border with uh, tibet right i mean obviously uh, and in fact now the lipu lake pass is not even functioning uh, that ro- route to kailash mansarovar is shut but uh, when i was doing my work uh, in fact uh, that route was open um so i don't see and also i have not spent years and years working on most manu as i mentioned this this uh, research just happened and it was fascinating so i thought i would share it uh, i would encourage uh, you know uh, researchers now to please go and work on this because as i said for me one lifetime seems to be not adequate to cover everything um but uh, the fact is that it is very much tied up with local community life so local concerns are still you know drought famine they told me that uh, two years ago we had a, a very severe drought there was not enough rain uh, crops failed and so we performed a big puja and sure enough within a week the clouds mm. came and it rained mm. and all that so most manu mm. you know helps out with all that mm. it's a it's it's a relatively simple temple uh, that's all i can point out i mean it's not uh, it's not a hugely complex hugely political temple with a lot of hierarchies mm-hmm. working here and there there's mm-hmm. one pujari who's been appointed by the temple trust now mm-hmm. uh, there's not a lot of conflict uh, at least there wasn't in 2013 when i was there Uh, mm-hmm. there wasn't a lot of conflict over the position of the pujari over you know how he mm-hmm. gets paid and this and that also so uh, i i i hope i don't know if that answers your question but i can't think of any uh, you know changes i think the perhaps the only change that uh, is happening is in the case of the infra tourism infrastructure required for that uh, annual mela because that crowd has been growing uh they will they do they needed more toilets even then they need more public toilets public amenities parking uh places to set up the shops i mean it was there were infrastructural issues that mm. needed working on i don't think those issues have as yet uh come to dominate the uh you know world of the temple and its functioning mm. thank you and aman also when you were talking about mahasu devta on our mm. youtube channel we had uh, mm. uh, dr lokesh ori talk about it a few mm. months back so you can mm. actually see that he's written a book also may kingdom come mm. and uh, mm. see that whole entire lecture where he talks about mahasu so i think mm. uh, because of the work that you're doing it will be very beneficial for you to uh, visit mm. uh, that lecture yeah okay. thank okay. you yeah and uh, we have the uh, next question uh, by jenny and before that i've also shared the uh, links on uh, the whatsapp group and i'll put it on the broadcast list as well in a little in a little bit both uh, dr lokesh ori's lecture and professor aditya malik and very soon dr yamini mumbai's lecture okay so jenny you can ask your question 
Uh, yes, in case of the stone, I was wondering how does it, how is it decided that it, it's either a male deity or a female deity? How, how does that come about? Um, because uh, apparently when the deity uh, decided to install himself in that particular spot, according to the origin myth, then uh, the spirit of the deity entered uh, this particular community member that I mentioned, the fish family. And uh, he made his identity known at that point. He gave his name and he gave where he was from. And uh, clearly he also said that he was uh, male. So it was, it is from there that they derived their information about the, the deity. And, uh, and on a lighter note, when you got on the swing and uh, did your wish come true? <laughs> now that I'm afraid, uh, that, that information I won't divulge right now. <laughs> But I, I would recommend the experience to everyone that being on that swing is really amazing. You feel like you're flying in the air. It's a great swing. We'll go to Pithoragar just for that. And of course, <laughs> your, no, and, and, and your lecture because it's an inspiration to know. And I'm so happy that, you know, just being here, you know, from our laptop, we can visit so many beautiful places around this whole chain of the Himalayas and get to know so much. And I was so right. uneducated before we started all of this. And thanks to all of you right. that uh, we've been able to converse and know about these little things that are, we are oblivious of because uh, all this research gets confined to a certain segment, you know, of uh, academia. And uh, it's so important to talk about these things and to relay all of this information to people who are not in academics as well. So absolutely. I think that's most important. Yeah. Why should you be in academics? I mean, I think everyone can enjoy uh, participating in these virtual trips. Right, right. And uh, having said that, and before, we, we do not have any questions yet, but I do want to make a couple of announcements, uh, if you all allow me. So uh, we will be announcing our next uh, lecture very soon. Uh, again, it will be Sunday, 7.30 uh, p.m. Indian Standard Time. I also uh, want to make an announcement that I had posted this competition, which I want all of you, and if you do not know of anyone, please just share it about um, uh, four temples in Kulu. Uh, I'm looking for photos. So uh, like Dr. Yamani, I, got, I get into a lot of ethnography and uh, um, uh, you know, oral uh, narratives. So I really want all of you to find sketches, uh, you know, old books which have black and white uh, photographs or sketches or paintings for that matter uh, that uh, talk about these four temples, the temple of Krishna in Thava, the second capital of the Kulu Kings, the Tripura Sundari temple, which has a, a lot of Buddhist Sanskrit uh, leanings, the Gauri Shankar temple of our great Lord Shiva and uh, uh, the Harihar temple. So if you know of anyone uh, uh, who has visited as a tourist of, uh, you know, your parents, your grandparents who visited and taken photographs, please send them to me. The deadline is 15th September. Uh, this is all for a project which I'll announce in October on our forum. So I would love it if you would spread the word. Uh, there is a prize and the prize is a surprise. So, <laughs> so if you could do that, uh, that will be wonderful. And um, uh, Dr. Yamini, we uh, really enjoyed your talk on this deity from Nepal who settled in, uh, you know, within the boundaries of India. And of course, the Himalayas know no boundaries. Uh, like you said, uh, uh, the passes, you know, we have had, um, you know, the Dalai Lama enter the country from these very passes. So how can we talk about uh, Himalayas as being, you know, just these uh, towering mountains standing and obstructing? So thank you for highlighting uh, this uh, little known deity. Uh, you have popularized uh, this deity uh, amongst all of us and we will uh, share uh, all about him. Uh, and if you would have your uh, you know, uh, words before we depart for the night. Um. Sorry, I was just writing a message to everyone. No, it's been a great pleasure. I'm. I'm so glad I'm 
I'm surprised that everyone took time out uh, from their Sunday evening, morning, whatever it is, wherever you are. Uh, it's a great pleasure. It's a privilege to be here. And it's, I mean, it's just wonderful to have had this audience. Um, as I said, you know, there's a lot that more that needs to be done uh, with respect to Most Manu and uh, with respect to Uttarakhand as well. Um, I would, I would really urge all researchers, historians, anthropologists uh, to, you know, please carry on, carry on this uh, wonderful work. Uh, just go and explore Most Manu some more. Uh, I don't know when I'll be able to do it. I hope I'll be able to do it sometime. But meanwhile, please go ahead and and, and explore these places because the you know the only thing about it is that these uh, cultural forms are so vulnerable uh, to being lost uh, or changed irretrievably. And uh, at most Manu, I felt that there was something very vital. Uh, that was a, a very vital story, at least, that uh, needed to be told. And that is why I focused really on the origin myth and, uh, you know, the, the story of the temple, because I think that is extremely powerful. Um, so thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much. And I, and I think we all need to digitize all these stories um, so that uh, they are uh, preserved for generations to come. On I think that is media. wonderful work that you're doing. I mean, it is, it's an amazing contribution to, uh, you know, to the countries and the subcontinent's cultural heritage. And thanks to all of you. And uh, we, 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 we should find ways of integrating all this research which is happening in the Himalayas through dialogue, uh, through even, you know, apps or something like that. I'm working on one of those right now where we kind of integrate all the, uh, uh, the temples you know, through an app. So, which is Wonderful. good for, for um, uh, researchers and uh, uh, tourists and people who, uh, uh, um, who want to learn. So, um, thanks to all of you for being here. And again, I have posted uh, lectures um, relating to Dr. Alok uh, Ori, who talks about Mahasu, and uh, Professor Aditya Malik, who talks about Golu Devta, the God of Justice, for those who want to revisit those. I have to, I've been delayed. Uh, I have to post uh, Dr. Vidha Joshi's lecture on the Naga textiles, Dr. Parth Chohan's lecture from last week, and of course, this week's lecture. I'm going to do it in the next two days. So I promise you all, I'll post them. And uh, ma'am, if you could uh, share your email on the WhatsApp group so that if anybody has questions, they can ask you and they can be in touch sure. with you. It's right here. Yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, wish you a very, very good night. And a very Thank you. good day. Who are good on Sunday to everyone. And good night to those who are on this side of the Prime Meridian. Yeah. Thank you. Good and night. And thank Sunday. you so much. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.